Um, okay, so I, I, I really wanted to talk to you guys today mostly because you all are on the ground level of what is already becoming a very erupting field of transportation mobility. And if, if you're urban planners or any, any academic, I, I think a few of you might be from LBJ and I know that there was an MBA student who might be coming. The point is this field is rapidly changing and I want to arm all of you guys with the right talking points for when people say nonsense such as autonomous vehicles are going to displace transit. There's no need for transit because we're going to have autonomous vehicles. So I'm going to give you a, a few talking points so that when you're in an elevator or at a dinner party or having your own practical discussion with other professionals that you can look at this through a, a new lens of how this can work for us. So quickly a little bit about my firm. We were founded by two women, actually, uh, they were women uh, muni planners, and they started their own uh, firm back in the 80s, Nelson and Nygaard, Bonnie Nelson um, and Diane Nygaard. And we have about 140 practitioners in eight cities now. And these are the areas in which we focus on. Uh, but my specialty and what we'll be talking about today is emerging mobility, but also a little bit of transit in there. Um, my second day on the job at Nelson Nygaard, I had a meeting in Dallas and I saw this and the, the world of reality came crashing down. So uh, if any of you plan on staying in Texas for your careers, know that, uh, and John Michael can tell you and, and a few of us who've been working in this field in Austin for a while, some days it feels like you're swimming through mud uh, to get some things done, but it's all baby steps. And this unique point in time is a great opportunity to actually leverage all the, the good stuff that technology can bring, if, only if we do it right. And I want to talk about this in terms of mode split. So transportation planners use mode split as pretty much the only metric that matters, uh, apart from perhaps throughput, which we'll talk about in a bit. And mode split is basically the best way to measure the health of your more mobility portfolio, right? In the United States, we are highly, highly skewed to the single occupancy vehicle, as many of us know. But how that's going to look in the future is really unknown. Um, so we have then, we have this now, which is that virtually any mode can be accessed via a smartphone. And there are some efficiencies to be gained just by virtue of being able to see what your next mobility step is going to be at any point in time. But in the very near future, there's reason to believe that that is going to be compounded, um, that you won't, may not even be actively paying for a transit pass as you board a transit vehicle, but rather as a known entity, your phone in your pocket and hardware on the bus, you're just getting on and off seamlessly. Likewise, we know that personal on-demand vehicles are going to transition to autonomous. We suspect the same is true for transit. And you'll see shared mobility as a really nice way to augment the rest of these higher capacity modes. So we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Oh yeah, I forgot to, it was animated. All right. So, so again, the mode split in the United States, you guys have seen this before, we don't need to go through the numbers. All the little tiny slivers of pie, are pie, are ped, bike, all the things that we're trying to get more of the United States. But could it be that we use this to make that mode split better? So let's talk about today. So I have a few stats on different mode splits in different cities. Uh, and we will bring this kind of back to Austin, although this is more universal to the United States. So one of our economic competitors in Austin is Seattle. This is their mode split, so just keep that in mind, about 75% non-drive alone. Denver is behind them, but still pretty darn good, right? 40% use transit. Meanwhile, in Austin, <laughs> We uh, don't have much transit in our downtown area. In fact, we don't really even know what our downtown mode split is. What we do know is what the census tells us through the ACS 
and we are almost, and this is old, and I, you know what, I didn't even try to make this graphic any better because that's like the last time we did it uh, in Austin. So we are, our friends at Austin Transportation Department are working to do a baseline, better understanding of what the mode split in Austin is, um, and try to do a survey just for what's going on downtown. But important to note that here we are thinking of ourselves as this Seattle-Denver competitor when in actuality looks like they're lapping us with regard to diversifying their <coughs> own mode split and portfolio. So what are some ways that we can nudge folks into other modes? So these new mobility service providers for whom you are all probably very familiar with have inundated Austin. You've seen probably several of these in town. Uh, actually, all of these have made a presence in Austin in some way, shape, or form. Even that little AV shuttle had a few test runs in downtown. And we like mobility service providers because quite frankly, they kind of came out of nowhere. They've only been around for 10 years or fewer. And we really like to, to think as a field that these guys are gonna solve all of our problems, right? Particularly as they go autonomous. Um, that's gonna probably help our situation in Austin and nationwide as most of it, but it's not the answer. So let's talk about what the answer looks like and these sort of three futures. So I like to break it down into, basically we talk about autonomous vehicles. Uh, like rhetorically, most people envision the single occupant type model on the left. Now, originally, maybe five years ago, whenever we talked about AVs, people always talked about it in a private model sense, private ownership model, that me, an individual, would go out and I'd buy one of these. The industry, even in the AV world of AV single occupancy, sort of sedan-like vehicles, if you want to look at it that way, um, they're not even talking about that anymore because that, that vehicle is like $300,000, right? So the shared component of it will, will probably be very likely. Not altogether that different from what we know today as Uber and Lyft, right? So if you want to see some hints at how behavior of, of single occupant and low occupant autonomous vehicles will look, follow what's going on with Uber and Lyft, right? We have increased VMT, we have a lot of deadheading, which is when a driver is driving around waiting to pick up a passenger. In the case of autonomous vehicles, that is known as zombie cars, so literally a car without a passenger. Um, and then you also hear people talk about autonomous transit, and what, what most people are thinking of are these sort of medium occupancy vehicles, the best mile, um, excuse me, easy mile, Navia, these types of vendors. And these are popular, but I've worked on a few of these projects, and they're so, they're really cute little vehicles, let's admit, but they're very, very sensitive. I was working with a, a case study in, um, in California where the hedge was overgrown on this path for one of these little shuttles, and, and it just stopped because it didn't really know what it was, right? So the, the technology is pretty nascent, but it's getting better and better every day. And then, of course, the high occupancy vehicles. So we'll talk about that. But we see the writing on the wall of where these are going now, right? Medium occupancy vehicles. We, we kind of know what that looks like, right? We have these shuttles operating, but we also have um, a more operationally efficient one at present known as microtransit. And you guys have seen that. Capital Metro did a pilot. Chariot is also microtransit, et cetera. But for some reason, Austin, we have not figured out the high occupancy game at all. Um, we have, again, really good hints at how well it could be doing by our Metro rapid routes, um, the 801 and the 803, but not necessarily truly high capacity. So where, where is this? Anybody know? Yeah, so this is um, just north of Republic Square, right, looking south at the river. And um, I always tell the story, basically, I, I, when I was teaching UT, the only way I can make my life and kid pick up and all that stuff work is because I relied on the 801 to get me very efficiently downtown, in and out. Um, 
once you cross the river, you're in mixed traffic, so it, it's kind of a moot point. But that one lane can save you 20 minutes on each leg just by being on the bus because you're basically flying by the people that are parked. So I took this picture from the passenger seat of a friend's car who has moved to Dallas. And he was, he was saying, oh, gosh, since I have moved to Dallas, this Austin traffic is just getting worse. And he's, he's sitting there and he goes, it's because they put that, bi that bus lane in. <laughs> And I was like, oh, my friend, that, that is not why. Um, and John Michael, th that was formerly a little bit of parking lane, all, all parking. So it's not like he had it to, his, uh, to use for a traffic lane anyhow before, but the optics, right? So what we're really talking about is the fact that the geometry of our streets is something that is a fixed asset, it's not growing, why then do we think autonomous vehicles are going to help us overcome some very basic geometric precedent? And you guys have all seen this version or some version of this before. This is like, you know, probably day number one of urban planning school is, hey, look, <laughs> when you make a decision about a street, make sure it's a good one. Because it's a two to 500 year decision, and in some cases, much longer than that, as we see in Europe. But the point is that um, the geometry here, I mean, there is just no way that a trip in an autonomous vehicle in the picture on the left is going to be ever more efficient than an autonomous vehicle in the picture on the right. But even more so, let's, I'm not even going to get into today all the other stuff you guys know in planning about public health and walking and 10,000 steps. Like, I'm, that's a given that this audience knows that. But suffice it to say that that's a, a key part of why planning streets as uh, well is a good thing. You've seen this a billion times, so here's a billion and one. But this is um, how I want to break it down and want you guys to start thinking about it in Austin. So in Austin, this is like a, a, a metaphor. It's not exactly uh, to scale for Austin's grid, but it's somewhat like Austin's grid. So imagine that the, na the lighter, lighter blue circles are towers and that the darker navy blue is the podium parking underneath those towers because that's how we like to do it in Austin, right? We, we build this, it's, it's, it's not really uh, a, a tower, right? It's really parkitecture, right? Um, if you look at some of our, our towers in Austin, you, you'll hear a lot of out-of-towners say, it's an odd-looking tower. It's because we, we do this podium. Like, what is this stuff? I mean, is that even, like, what is this, you know? So you got to think about it. You know, and another topic somewhat related to, to um, AVs and parking is if this AV thing really takes off, these parking garages are going to be totally empty. So maybe we should think a little bit uh, more strongly about why we're doing this, right? Well, why we're doing this is because the capital markets and the lenders for the developers are saying it's necessary. And in the absence of regulation on parking maximums, then this is what, this is what happens. So it's, um, I'll, I'll say that one of these towers is Facebook. And, and a lot of folks decide to leave at 5 o'clock. That one floor of the one tower has now filled up the street. And so people are so confused why we have traffic in Austin downtown, and yet we have to hire cops to let people out of garages. I mean, this is just simply a math problem, okay? So let's pretend for a moment that there are no drivers in these cars, and these are actually just passengers, and oh boy, all the cars are connected, and we just gain so much efficiency through the fact that these cars can talk to each other now. Well, ask folks in Zilker what it's like when technology tells automobiles where to go. Because if you're all familiar with the, the Waze cut-through phenomenon, the way that an autonomous vehicle works is through computers, right? Decisions, binary zeros and ones. So much like we know how it will mitigate traffic and make smart decisions on congestion, we see early indications of what that looks like today with Waze. So Waze sees congestion, the algorithm tells X amount of drivers to reroute, 
and then they cut through neighborhoods. And Zilker's having a really tough time with that right now because, well, I shouldn't tell you this hint, but if you want to skip Lamar traffic, you just go through Zilker and you can get on Mopac. So that's what's happening. Um, and unfortunately, our friends over at the engineering school uh, are being taught to design this, which is uh, ITE, the um, Institute of Transportation Engineers, um, basically follows this natural law of engineering called level of service. And uh, level of service is basically how they gauge the success of an intersection, right? So an engineer would tell you that this picture on the right is, is a higher level of service. Now that precedent is starting to change slowly, slowly, slowly. But um, the IT manual, which is, which is now in its 10th edition, basically aggregates the nation's case studies of land development codes and land development and then uses that to help engineers come up with basically multipliers for how to then decide how traffic's going to flow in their models. Meanwhile, um, at McCombs, uh, folks that are studying the economy would tell you that this picture on the left is pretty much the perfect storm of having a good retail street. So, so what's the disconnect, right? It's also about the amount of space that, that parking takes up in the lane, right? So put all this together. Um, this is a study that Moval did where they took all the surface parking lots surrounding downtown Chicago and then said, if I were to empty that lot, how many car lanes would that take up? And again, like there's one and then that lane's full. So you have all these like schools of thought that are really just coming together and not getting along very well. All of the while, we are just saying, eh, let's just punt, let's just kick the can because AVs are gonna save us. So what can we do to move people efficiently? The bottom line is that we have to fix <coughs> throughput, right? If we're going to make our streets space efficient and with the goal being to move people, because again, the old paradigm is how many cars can we move efficiently through an intersection? You've seen the tubes, they're counting cars. They're not counting people. Those tubes do not count people. You know what I'm talking about? Those tubes, in, right? So when we talk about trips, in, in this geography, in Texas, in California, they talk about trips, they, they're talking about person trips, usually. And they're measuring that through survey, et cetera. When we talk about trips, we're talking, unfortunately, just about auto trips. So we have to start changing that paradigm. And the first way to do it is to talk about person throughput. Because what's basically happening right now is in this paradigm that's on the left, you, if this gets stuck at an intersection, you're basically saying to the people on the bus that your time is worth 1 40th of that of the individual in the car, right? But in this paradigm, we have something that's a little bit more of a, a win for everybody. If, if you want to reward folks for taking higher occupancy modes, you have to do it through giving them something that is time competitive, right? And that's good for blue collar folks, white collar folks, the single working mom who's trying to use transportation as her only means of transportation. Uh, so we look at this and we say, okay, this is interesting. Um, now when you look at it and you think about the, the numerical throughput, right? So as a concept, yes, that makes sense. Let's take an actual street and do it. Again, transit, transit wins. We did this study on Wilshire Boulevard just to measure, okay, what, what could we do if we wanted to measure actual throughput for what is today LA's Wilshire Boulevard and what it could be in the future? Here's another way of looking at it. And this is um, basically an urban design way of looking at the same numbers. So we worked on this, my firm worked on this exercise with uh, Perkins and Will, which is an architecture firm that actually owns us and with Lyft. So Lyft was interested in doing some safer pickup drop-off zones and looking at how high capacity transit could serve Wilshire Boulevard. And what you see is 
the paradigm today versus the one that could be, and this is the actual mathematical throughput uh, of that, that exercise. Okay, so let's talk about why we don't do this and the hurdles to overcome. Well, right now, um, whenever we talk about getting dedicated right-of-way for transit, the first thing that people are obsessed with is mode. So they want to know, is it light rail, uh, is it BRT, and then this emerging mode known as ART, or Autonomous Rapid Transit. Um, this is a little exercise we did for Project Connect. And this, if, for those of you familiar with Project Connect, um, it's very, very early in its overall phase of project delivery. Um, we have not even gone to conceptual engineering yet. However, um, the point we were trying to make in this exercise is that don't give rhetoric about future, future proofing. Don't spend hundreds of thousands of dollars seeing how Austin can prepare for autonomous vehicles. No, you decide how you want to prepare for autonomous vehicles. And in doing so, start thinking now about the street lanes that you have to dedicate in order to make that happen. Um, the other hurdle that we would have to overcome in Austin is precisely the paradigm I was telling you guys about, uh, which is this public perception of taking away a lane and, and what that, um, let's all admit, if you're in traffic and there's a lane that does not seem to be utilized, it's very natural to then say, well, why can't we use that lane? But what people don't understand is though they see buses moving every X amount of minutes, it's the number of people on the bus. So we have to think of ways that we can uh, kind of coach the public, if you will, on why this is a good thing. And so autonomous rapid transit is, is potentially something that can make this argument a little bit easier because you see as, as folks want to have uh, autonomy be a part of the solution, it may actually help us in transit to apply those tenants there as well. So there is reason to believe that the driverless concept that people talk about for single occupant cars are going to be uh, applicable then to transit vehicles as well. This is the sort of nebulous concept that is emerging. Um, there's not anything concrete in the United States that we could point to and say, for example, but um, we're getting there. Uh, I wanted to also mention that automation and transit is not new. So uh, you can let transit take a little bit of the cake here and say, oh, well, transit's been doing automation uh, for eons. And basically, if you've ever ridden the DFW SkyTrain, that's what it is. The other one to be familiar with that's probably the best example in North America is um, Vancouver SkyTrain. If you've ever ridden this, I love this picture because it looks like that little kid is kind of driving. But um, actually, no one's driving. There is a bunch of people in a dark room um, basically figuring out the, the operational components of the train. And then soon in the United States, we will have uh, an autonomous rapid transit. And this is automated and autonomous are slightly different in this context, right? Um, autonomous is, is using more artificial intelligence, whereas automated is really just back-end computer systems making the whole thing work. Um, but again, these nuances are neither really here nor there. Um, and this is where automation and transit is actually headed. So we don't have full autonomy in transit, nor do we have it in uh, lower occupancy modes, but we're getting there. And to sum all this up, because I want to take a lot of time for questions, um, I really just want you guys to have the toolkit of uh, nomenclature to help folks understand that, yes, automation is coming. Um, it is potentially going to help us but only if we use it as an excuse, if you will, to overcome and do the things that we should have been doing all along. So the stuff I'm talking about, making transit lanes and uh, moving people efficiently through a city street, that is not new at all, right? But that conversation is definitely being forced 
uh, as something that is critical for urban planners, transportation planners, economists, everybody to work together to make sure that we are thinking about how we design our streets to work for us. And uh, I just want you guys to, to leave with that note. Uh, keep up the good fight and uh, keep doing what you're doing. Um, and I'll take any questions you may have. Jordan Tweet. Yes. You mentioned the fact that lenders are also contributing to this issue. Mm -hmm. Could you speak to that issue a little bit in Austin? Are you aware of developers who would build uh, you know, uh, towers with no parking if they could because they feel that the market would support that? Sure. So I'll, I'll just quickly, for those of you not familiar with this uh, overarching kind of statutory and uh, market-driven, market-driven, Dynamic. What basically happens in development, especially with towers, but true for all like mixed-use development, right? And you guys have probably done this in real estate classes or whatever. But um, I'm a developer. I want to build X amount of residential, X amount of office. And I use some ratio that somebody on my team arbitrarily gave me of like, for every 1,000 square feet of, of space I build, I need three parking spots or whatever. I'm handed this number from a parking consultant or somebody that tells me what I need to build. Now, most developers know that number. They know their, what they think is to be their number, be it four per thousand or six per thousand, whatever. And they're using, if they get, they're getting that number, someone's getting that number through real estate market comps, right? So they're seeing what the market is asking for, what their tenants are. So when, when a, a broker goes to lease it, the tenants are saying, well, if I'm going to, on Facebook, I'm going to sign a deal in that tower, I want, you know, four per thousand, whatever it is. Now, in, in the western states, so particularly Washington, Oregon, and California, all three of those state legislatures have, um, through different mechanisms, for some it's CO2 emissions, as in the case of California, they basically have, uh, allow their jurisdictions, allow their cities to create parking maximums, right? So this is, a, if you're going to do a development, this is the max you can do. Now, that helps the, le the developer for a few reasons. One, it gives them credence to go to their lenders and say, this is all I can do here. So that, that helps uh, navigate that conversation. But in places like Austin where there isn't necessarily a max or there's trade-offs for, uh, like, there, like this in our lifetime, like as in six months ago, um, a tower at... Uh, I guess it's fourth in Colorado was approved by design commission that has 13 floors of parking. And I think it has some, something like 10 to 12 floors of office space. So there's more parking than office. I mean, this looks crazy, you guys. Um, now, I think that, and I'm not too close to this part of it, but my understanding is that it is very difficult for a developer who in earnest wants to build less parking for a number of reasons. Let's, for one, admit that it's more leasable space. If I, if I build fewer floors of parking, I can then build more of office. So that's kind of a no-brainer. Um, and two, there are these consultants that are warning me, ah, you might not want to spend all this money on parking if it's not even going to be needed in 20 years. Right? We're already seeing that happen a little bit with Uber and Lyft. But my understanding is when they go to, and it's a lot of times institutional money, it's, it's Texas teachers' retirement, it's CalPERS, it's these, these lenders uh, or institutional money are saying, nope, the market will not bear that little parking. Now, there are examples in Austin, such as the Aloft, which is a hotel downtown, um, that has no parking. And they were able to skip a part of their zoning process known as the TIA, the Transportation Impact Assessment, because they just said there will be no trips because there will be no parking. Now, how those people are getting to the hotel, it's through a trip. But that, that's kind of how that went. Do you know of any other examples, John Michael? And do you know of any, like, how, how that, the color of money is different in those cases? I think 
think it was actually a physical limitation. They're building a very narrow tower mid block. And it's a, it's a historic building on the bottom. So they're doing some adaptive reuse. So they really just couldn't make it work. So that's, but the demand for downtown units is such that, that they were able to find some money as well. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's the, the extent of what I know about it. But I know that um, I, I think that we're all wasting our time going to conferences about each other's topics. And we should all be going to the institutional investor conferences <laughs> and telling them, like, warning. <laughs> but I am, anecdotally, I am seeing a few of our developer clients go, yeah, you know, our, our portfolio is, is a little overparked. So they're kind of looking at stuff they've already built and going like, yeah, maybe we don't need to do so much. Yeah. I just, with, just on that topic, you know, we do have an example of what's already happening as West Campus. Those garages are happening. Uh, yeah, and, and, and you guys probably understand this real estate dynamic, but like, if that were my house, right, if like the whole tower is my house and I owned it and it was my money, I'd be like, oh, that really hurts, right? That's so much wasted money. I could be leasing that space out and it's just empty. But that's not the way that these markets work because these are five to 10 year investments before they're sold off into a, another portfolio. So basically, if I built the tower and exited in five years, it's no skin off my back if it's overused parking because we're not having 30 years. Now, sometimes institutional investors do have longer payback periods on their portfolios and thus should be more interested. But in general, we're turning things over too quickly in the United States for that to matter right now. Yes. Um, what do you see as the likelihood of Cap Metro being able to implement ART and do you think it's a good idea for them to be focusing on it? Well, that's a real loaded question. Um, I'll tell you what, um, Project Connect, so I am, in full disclosure, helping them look at uh, high capacity transit, right, of all kinds. And I think that ART is very nebulous right now, and it's being defined in the marketplace. Um, my, my take on it and the counsel I give my client is that we have no history of project delivery in Austin. So to be able to say that we can confidently deliver a new technology is a little, is a little hard. And um, similar to the fact that I wouldn't take marriage advice from someone who's never been married, I would be a little bit reticent. Like we're looking at other cities like San Antonio and Las Vegas who are also interested in this. Guess what? They too have never been married. Like maybe we should now when... Portland and Seattle and, and places that have delivered high capacity transit portfolios post World War II because yes we all know the pre World War II cities have high capacity transit but you guys know all the reasons that that's the case post World War II ability to deliver high capacity transit San Francisco with BART uh, WMATA in Washington D.C. and then the newer systems in Portland and Seattle they have a cadre of professionals that can project deliver, okay? They just do, they churn out projects. Um, we don't have that cadre of professionals in Austin. We just don't have the talent pool. We can hire it, we can bring it in, but we, we probably, the, the short answer to your question is, we're gonna find out the answer to your question in the next two years, because we, much more analysis has to be done. Um, if it's such that uh, there are, there is a good opportunity to take advantage of all the things I was talking about, maybe we should. And it's certainly good to look at it with a future-proofing lens, but the most important thing is that transit dedicated lane. Yeah. yeah if I could piggyback on that, what type of rhetoric do you hope to see from civic leaders regarding Project Connect? And how should that rhetoric be different from what you saw in 2014 and all the other previous well, we could have a whole course on why 2014 did not work. <laughs> There's not one reason. Um, but the first part of your question about what civic leaders can do, um, this is going to be really tough, okay? 
we have a traffic problem and the general public sees the solution to that as adding more capacity through lanes of auto traffic. We have to completely coach, and, and I think leadership should be doing this, we have to coach the public about throughput and saying like an efficient economy requires efficient throughput. This is a Republican argument. I mean, this is so much of our economic health hinges off of our ability to deliver high capacity transit. I mean, we were not a blip on the radar of HQ2 because uh, Amazon's headquarters search because we do not have high capacity transit and we will continue to lose. Now, um, one of the ways that that has been done effectively in places like uh, Everett, Massachusetts uh, is a great example. Everett's a suburb of Boston and they had horrible traffic heading in and out of Boston. So they took baseline information, gave it to the public. Hey, this is how many cars are getting through the corridor. We're going to put up cones and make a bus lane and see how traffic moves and how people move. And it was just too time competitive to not be tempted to try to take the bus. So there was mode shift and behavior change that occurred as a result of that experiment. And now it's been permanized. So it's, it's now a, a permanent bus lane, semi-permanent. But that is, uh, we're going to have to get gain the trust of the public through time about transit dedicated lanes. And we're going to have to focus the conversation. Now, using one thing that has not worked for Austin and did not work in 2014, we made up a term called urban rail. That is not a thing in transportation, nor is um, dedicated pathways. That's not a term. And don't be fooled, you guys. Like, you are transportation professionals. We have jargon. We use a lot of jargon, right? We like high capacity transit, like all this stuff. But high capacity transit says what it is. So that is something that the public should be able to uh, take. Right of way is jargon, but we use that with the public. So, so just because you make up a word does not mean you're going to fool them. See, I'm a little concerned that like we're going to go to the voters and say, oh yeah, we have like dedicated pathways, like in a meadow, you know? <laughs> and then they're going to be like, oh wait, shit, that means taking away a lane from my street? Like, I, I say we don't fool them. I say we, we have, peel off the mandate and have that difficult conversation now. But that requires, uh, but I'm not running for office again, so yeah. So you're looking at a few of the images you had. You had planning 101 with the connectivity issue. Mm. Then you have the image going down into South Austin. And in South Austin, you have tremendously bad connectivity. Mm -hmm. So even if you add a link, are you going to be able to actually have people use the transit down south when it takes 25 minutes to walk to the bus? Are you talking about like in neighborhood streets? Yeah. Like I live in South Austin, and it takes me 25 minutes to walk to the bus. Because you have poor street connectivity. Street connect yeah, if I, didn't, if I had better connectivity, it would take me 10 minutes. Yeah, right. So well, that's, that's pervasive throughout. Totally. 100%. And so there, there's no that. technology that's going to overcome that. I mean, you're yeah. s now you could, you could increase your speed by getting on a scooter or taking a bike rather than walking, right? But, I mean, those are major policy changes. To, I mean, again, once the streaker is there, it's there. Mm -hmm. Now, you could use, in theory, the power of eminent domain to make pedestrian paths to make that connectivity easier. But like we can't do the basics, so we're not we're not there yet. Yes. Well, I'm finding it a bad idea to confuse rail systems with automated vehicles and say transit has always been automated. Um, what happens if buses become automated? and we can get the power to put more bus-only lanes on streets. What would the cost savings be? Could we put more buses out there and move more people? Do we always have to present things to the voters as this one rail line or two rail lines or 20 or 30 years? Right. I mean, if automated vehicles exist, we could buy them and put them out in a year. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have to 
build a huge thing that disrupts businesses and creates problems for five, ten years to build. So what is the future for automated buses? And the example the gentleman just gave, I mean, we could have little of those mini buses running around neighborhood streets and maybe he could grab one of those and if it ran in, in its own lane, or even if it didn't, it might not take him 25 minutes to get to the main hall bus. Right. What are, what are the potential for that kind of... Oh, it's transit? huge. It's huge. So that sort of first... I think you're talking kind of like a, a first no, no, mile, no, last mile? I'm talking about both. First okay. Last mile. Okay, so yeah. So you get to Lamar Boulevard, there's, there's these automated vehicles running. Right. So there's a few there's a few components. I like to think about it as okay. First, the definition. So we have automated rail lines, but it's because they're on a track, and yeah, so exactly. it's just like driving, uh, you know, a train on a play track. That is that technology is not difficult. The French cracked it 30 years ago. We can rinse and repeat all all day long. Um, that's not the expensive part. It's the infrastructure that's expensive. So I like to separate the conversations into two things. There's the network geometry. And then there is the, the mode, which is really supposed to be just answering the call of the capacity need, right? So if you have a good geometry, which I think we were talking about, whereby arterial streets have high frequency, high capacity transit that is reliable, delightful, and all of the above, then how I get there could potentially be served by a lower capacity. It's not viable yet because those little easy mile vehicles, I've ridden in one probably three or four times now, and every time I do it, it's like at a conference, and there's always this French guy who's getting paid like $100,000 a year to be like, Madame, where would you like to drive the car? I mean, this is not, it's not there yet, right? So they have an iPhone, they sit in the car with you, and they're doing all this stuff. And these are like sales guys. They're, they're being paid six figures. And they go in and, um, well, we couldn't afford to serve uh, South Austin neighborhoods with that model right now because of the labor costs, which has always been the problem with why, like people say, why don't people take transit in the United States? It's because it's not time competitive, it, all the land use problems we have, and the reason we can't come every five minutes is because we're paying our drivers a living wage. So people look at this model and they're like, oh, well, once the driver's gone, hallelujah, we can just serve people every two and a half minutes with Japanese frequency and reliability. And I don't think that's totally going to be true because, um, well, a survey was just done by NYU's uh, Rudin Center about women and transportation. and. Women don't feel comfortable in a lot of instances, especially late at night, in an empty vehicle. The driver provides a, a sense of security. The driver also, uh, in many cases, helps folks that are handicapped get on the, the vehicle. Um, so I do think we'll move to like an attendee model, where rather than paying an operator who's a professional driver sixty to eighty thousand dollars a year, we'll have an attendee who provides some level of security, accountability, et cetera, on the vehicle, helps folks board and alight. And maybe that person's in the $40,000 range. So there will be some cost savings, but I don't think the individual employee is going away. That's my personal opinion. But there could be this sort of utopia where the, the higher capacity vehicles have an attendee, a patron to sort of help, and then um, you're, you're being served by smaller, lower occupancy vehicles. But by the way, all of this is like this vision for this shared economy, and like people don't, people's heads are buried in their cell phones these days. You know, I just hold or talk on cell phone addiction and why it's bad for transportation, but that's like, <laughs> anyway. The point is that um, uh, people think that well, we're going to be... People get on all those cute pictures you showed of rail systems that you held out as models. There's a, they're not attended. Well, they have fair enforcement. So they, ha they have security officers that come on board. On every vehicle? Not everyone, but they, they sort of monitor. Yeah, so... And, and the, the paradigm is shifting because those are all dedicated right-of-way mm -hmm. off-street. 
When we talk about autonomous buses, we're talking about on street, which suddenly becomes way more dangerous because pedestrians and cyclists and all the other things that present themselves in the street, that vehicle now has to navigate all that. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know how, we don't know what AI is going to be able to achieve in the next few years, but it's going to be interesting to be on riding that wave. Yeah, Zach? What's your best hope for adoption timeline for automated transit systems in the United States? Best case scenario, maybe, and then most unlikely, I guess, to be honest. All of it depends on money. And without getting political, the current administration is not prioritizing public transit. So it used to be you go to the feds and if you had a really good application, you could probably get 50-50. Uh, those days are gone. It's now like more like 80-20, 80, 80 local to 20% federal. Um, so we missed the boat because you know our, our 2000 election would have been 50-50 and it lost by what, like 1800 votes or something? Yes. Uh, why Waymo is not active here? Yes. Um, I don't. I don't. I mean, do you know, John Michael, why Waymo is not active anymore in Austin? I can't comment. Okay. Going back to the dedicated space for transit component, how we get that in kind of smaller cities across the U.S., like you don't. It's more of, so you don't need a, a referendum to dedicate space to transit. Technically, like the city traffic engineer, granted they're constrained by political constraints of apartment right. and whatnot, but like the city traffic engineer has the authority to say, it's in the code, they can say this is a bus lane because I said so, because this is based on engineering thinking or it's based on right. some design manual. And like technically all engineers are looking at the same design manuals here referencing that are kind of antiquated and, and auto-based. Um, but in other cities that have done this better, what if you, if you have any, like, I just feel like here in Austin, decisions are, are too much based in the design manuals and the kind of like gut feeling of how that will impact traffic mm. or whatever. Um, but clearly engineers in other cities are making decisions differently. Yeah, well, that's because they have more plan engineers like yourself. Um, so that paradigm is changing in, in more progressive cities. Um, so the way it works is that it usually, in the case of Seattle and Portland, it is coming from the top. It's coming from political leadership who go, do something, bureaucrat who I hired about this gridlock. And I don't really care what you do, but we've got to get, make it better. And then the professional, uh, I think there, that's the issue, is that there's two factions of professionals. There is an auto-dominated mentality, and then there's an emerging group. I, I would call that group like the NACTO group, the National Association of City Transportation Officials. And here we go again. It's an urban-rural divide. I mean, that is what it comes down to. And in states like Texas, the rural, rurally interest-based legislature likes to tell Austin what it can and cannot do. So I have this concern that let's pretend tomorrow all of our political leadership championed transit dedicated lanes, which, by the way, if that happened, like, we would just be super thrilled because that's what we need. If that happened and they executed it, I'm not so sure that the legislature would be okay with it. Um, they've, they've told us what we can do with our TNCs. They've told us what we can do with our bags, our plastic bags. And there is a Texas law now. It's called a 22, Senate Bill 2205, if you ever are in a Googling mood. And it, it was under this moniker of innovation. And it was passed last session. 
And it basically says that any, um, any subdivision of a state, aka a city, uh, may not regulate, extract data, or price a vehicle once the driver is gone. And it had two Democratic sponsors and two Republican sponsors. And this thing's passed, and it's what, law. What does that mean? And what that means is that, let's pretend our current transportation director, his name's Rob Spiller. If Waymo or whomever came to town and said, yeah, you know, um, I would like to do an autonomous vehicle test here with no driver. Rob Spiller has zero say. He cannot protect the safety of Austin citizens. He has nothing, he has nothing to say. He cannot regulate it, he cannot price it, and he cannot extract data from it. Now, if the vendor wanted to be uh, ever so grateful and give it, that could be a partnership. But the, te the state of Texas wants to take away power from the cities, they call that preemption, to be able to regulate this. So it was done for like innovation and the economy, but really that hurts cities big time because now the transportation department can't do anything meaningful to help the cause of citizens who are trying to work with, like if we're really gonna phase this autonomous stuff in, we gotta know how many are on the street. We have to be able to price them so that maybe they're paying a registration fee similar to that of anybody else that has a car. It's crazy stuff, you guys. This already passed. This is like done. And, and a friend of mine who uh, works in this industry and was in the committee room when this discussion was happening was like, oh, and just the way it's written, it's really difficult to repeal at this point. Um, so you all have a lot of work to do. Yes? Just, uh, just back to the sort of high capacity non-rail, <clears throat> and you know, also maybe a political sliver of hope. You know, it seems like whether they're completely autonomous or you know, just have a lot of sort of semi-autonomous uh, systems, it seems like uh, you know that you could have a really seriously dedicated lane, maybe not off grade, but with clear, and you know at. At five o'clock, you could run three of these long things together, and at uh, ten at night, you could have one. And it seems like it would be much less costly whether you had a driver or not, just in terms of the infrastructure versus you know rail. And perhaps you could sell it to the public as a new technology, a, a new way to get around, cheaper, efficient, da da da. So, is there any prospect, as you see it, of having kind of really a new technology, whether it's fully or partially autonomous on street tire type vehicles. Oh, sure, sure. And, and every, I think all cities are, are looking at that. Um, what you're talking about is coupling. That's not new. We couple light rail vehicles and heavy rail vehicles all the time to, to answer the call of the demand, like at rush hour. And that's why if you're in Brooklyn taking the subway at eight, you know, at 6 p.m., that the train is like, you know, as long as the eye can see. And it, it's to meet that capacity demand. I think the concern is you spend all this money on these rubber tire vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure uh, technologies, and no matter what, a, an articulated bus will never be able to meet the ridership demands that we're projecting in certain corridors. So that's, that is the concern of a lot of the transit advocates who dweeb out on this stuff is that, look, the model indicate, we have a pent up demand in Austin. We actually have the a ride, ridership models that Project Connect has done shows that from a mathematical standpoint, the only mode available to our disposal at present to meet it is light rail. Well, there's others like heavy rail, but that's a non-option for the context we're talking about. Um, and, and it, similarly, the subway conversation. Like, of course, a subway would be awesome. Like, duh. But again, like, that's like, you know, wanting to be 30 years married and you haven't even met a girlfriend or boyfriend yet. Like, no, 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 no. Like, baby steps here, guys. We, we can't even do the basics. Don't, like, subways are for the big boys, okay? Actually, that doesn't make any sense to me. 
How a so? A light rail vehicle how holds one car holds how many people? Uh, about 250. One car holds 200. Well, when we talk about capacity per car, we're talking about sitting and standing. So like uh, uh, the 801, the 803 articulated, those are like 150, something like that. John Michael was close to that project at the time. Something like that. Sitting and standing. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. And the wooden three buses of these new non-existent at this time, mm -hmm. but AV buses, if you link them together, wouldn't they have the same capacity? Well, we don't know because not uh, such a thing doesn't exist, but I think that's the idea and that's the I mean, there's no product. So I think what we're trying to do in Austin is like to invent one. <laughs> Um, yes, in theory, that is what it would look like. But if tomorrow we said we, uh, by miracle, everybody, in, you know, a vast majority of people in Austin said that they wanted this, okay, then we have to go get uh, a manufacturer to move a plant to the United States. That's four to five years because it has to be, you know, made in USA requirements for procurement. Um, and then we would have to build it so we're talking six years for something that is it doesn't exist we're inventing a product okay i get i get that yeah. doesn't exist but it costs how many years does it take to put a, a light rail if we voted yes in 2020 we could have something probably by like 2025 20, 20 uh, yes, but but I'm I'm making up the timeline for the bus one. I, I don't know that. Now, what we could do is sort of like a phase model, right, where we have existing BRT technologies, and I'm going to make up a number. Let's make it easy. Let's say we spend $100 on BRT vehicles for the whole fleet on the corridors that we're calling high capacity. And then this technology does come around 10 to 15 years later, and we replace the fleet with this new technology. We're going to... That $100 spent was not a waste because those vehicles will just be repurposed elsewhere in the network. So it's, not, it's no skin off anybody's back if we go straight to BRT unless it becomes that expensive mistake of like, oh my gosh, we're three years in and nobody can get a seat because it's, we, we didn't accurately meet the capacity needs uh, uh, at, on the onset. Now, uh, there are several Canadian cities that have switched their BRT systems to LRT. Um, and it wasn't, you know, it, it's, you'd have to do the math on it, but it wasn't a total waste. They got a 30-year, 20-year BRT system out of it. Um, and now LA is trying to do it on the orange line. And, and that's going to be a lot more expensive. Yeah. Isn't the push for light rail just uh, like more kind of mode fetishism? Like, There's a, there, the totally. Like, yeah. There's certainly BRT systems, true BRT systems in the global south that reach subway like capacity. A hundred percent. Why couldn't because there yeah, like totally. Like the I, I agree with you that there are people that are they have the blinders on, right? But the the mode conversation is, you know, really the way it should work is you you deliver your numbers your, your model, and again, it's a model. It's, this is difficult stuff. The capacity requirements, and you see what is available on the store shelf for me to, to meet those requirements. And I can say as a transportation professional that in some cases, if we looked at what we could purchase today, in some areas, the only appropriate mode to match that demand is LRT, or something even higher than that, which is, again, implausible because of the context. Now, I think like those, you guys saw that mashup of all those pictures, there's several answers to versions of this. And I think we'll see more and more technology that's somewhere between LRT and BRT come out. The frustrating thing to me going to all these California conferences is that for every transit conference we have where we're talking about this, there are 15 autonomous vehicle conferences and the OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, car companies, are way ahead in the technology development of AI as it applies to fleets. Transit is way behind. 
They're just drafting behind the findings in R&D of the automakers. There are very few examples that I have been able to find of transit rolling stock manufacturers taking the lead on AI or a time. They're just going to say, whatever they're doing, we'll buy it, you know. But it's a different application. So that, I think part of that is that there isn't a market demand for it as, uh, as there has been perceived for the, the sedan-like model. Yeah. With what? The stick. Oh, yeah, carrot and stick. Yeah, yeah. So I want to know what kind of stick a city of Austin had, or like you think city of Austin should have. Okay, they have none. What I think that they should have. Congestion fee or. Yeah. You just provide goods and people say, okay, I just do my own service. They don't care. That's right. So, yeah, I agree. So that's a whole other. Uh, study, a field of study in transportation, right? Transportation demand management, which is basically economics and it's carrot and stick. And like, what are the incentives and disincentives that we give the marketplace to nudge behavior the way that we want to see it? And uh, the city of Austin does not have much. Um, there, there are some programs with employers that the city's been working really hard on to try to help employers help their employees understand their options. Um, one of the best levers is increasing the price of parking. Because if I am a entry level employee, and I always be on Facebook, but that's too easy these days. So if I am an entry level employee at Facebook, um, why, like, in what world is it, like, am I just entitled to a parking spot? I'll tell you the world, Austin, Texas. and. If, if instead, when Facebook goes to buy their lease for, for the however many floors of the tower they have, and the broker says to him, all right, look, I'm going to give you X amount of square feet for X amount of price, and if your employees want a parking spot, it's whatever, $250 a month, which now is the way that the marketplace is going. So 10 years ago, that wasn't the case in Austin, and now you're seeing more and more brokers decouple the parking lease from the office space lease. And then the employer, that, that helps the employer a lot because then they don't, they're like, well, here's 250, take it or leave it. What you don't see is, and we should see more of, is parking cash outs. So if Michael and I work at the same employer and I just decide that I want to drive to work every day and Michael decides he wants to take the 801 and I get a free parking spot, that's costing my employer something. In Austin market rate, it's probably costing my employer about 180 bucks. So why isn't Michael entitled to $180 in cash that he could use towards his bike or his transit? That is something that in other states, uh, through something called trip caps, the uh, state is making certain employers report how many trips they're generating as a result of their development or their uh, campus, in, in the case of Silicon Valley, and they're capped. What that does is it forces Google and Facebook and all those big campuses out in Silicon Valley, it forces them to have a transportation demand manager on site. And that individual does the carrot and sticking. So they're like, I only got 5,000 trips I can generate. I got 20,000 people on this campus. How else can I get people in and out? And that so I think TDM is, is the best way to do it. And, and City of Austin Transportation Department has a TDM practitioner who's really doing great things. So I think you'll start to see more of it soon. What about also signal timing to reduce the efficiency with which you can move around in a car? Which reduce it was an implied stick, right? Or it's, yeah, I guess an implied stick. Because some of the signal timing connections in Austin aren't times where most people would say, well, but if you're in a bike, it's much better than if you're in a car. If you can, assume you can get through the, the cycle without getting hit by a car, um, in those cases, yeah. Um, I don't 
don't know that many instances of that being done intentionally. I don't think it needs to be done intentionally because unintentionally the light, the light cycle sucks. So, uh, <laughs> oh, are you talking about like transit signal prioritization? Both. Okay. We don't even have to try to make it hard to drive a car. It's getting more and more miserable without anybody trying. Like, right, yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. So that in and of itself means the bus looks better. Yes, if you can make it time competitive. Right. And the reason the bus is not time competitive is because there's this sort of, we don't have dedicated space for transit, right? And then we were talking a little bit, I don't know if I answered all your question, but Another, another distinction here is between transit priority lanes and transit dedicated lanes, okay? If you really want that precision, it has to be transit dedicated, which means no right turns, and it means it goes through the intersection, it always gets priority. And this is a, a science that is, has been perfected. This is not impossible. There are plenty of cities in the United States who have done it and done it well. And you know, in the orange line in LA, I mean, I can't even remember being at a light because you're just clocking. You're just always getting the green. Um, and so thus you're making the cars wait. But it, it's not being done as a mechanism that's anti-car. It's a pro-transit priority. Yeah. No. In the 2020s, or are there alternative options to mobility that have nothing to do with mass transit? And say instead it's based on an all ability using ages, all ages and abilities bicycle. Like is that a successful strategy here in Austin? Can we meet the coffee behavior in the United States? No, because our land use is so shitty. <laughs> I mean you just can't bike from Leander to downtown in due process at 104 degrees outside. It, you, know, it, you don't think e-bikes will change that if they had a dedicated right away for bicycles? Uh, it still would take you 30 minutes to get into downtown. If you were... I mean, for me, 30 minutes is good. Well, okay, what I'm getting at is, okay, so the first part of your question, Project Connect, is it success or failure predicated on whatever happens in 2020? There are components of Project Connect that don't need money outside of what's already been allocated and the stream of revenue that could be allocated in order to deliver better high capacity transit all over the city. And an example of that is Riverside Corridor. I mean, I always joke that if ABI were shut down and we needed to land a plane, like, we got Riverside, you're good. Like, you could <laughs> land a plane on that thing, right? There is so much space and, and it's really disheartening to, um, I have a European friend who's always reminding me like, don't go native and just always buy into the excuse of there's, oh, there's not enough right away. She's like, this is crazy. This is crazy amount of right away. And it is, it's insane. So we could very easily deliver a transit dedicated lane in theory, not poli politically, but in theory, technically on Riverside and improve the situation. Now, do we also need a better bike network? Absolutely. For both first and mile, last mile to transit, and as the A, B trip, you know, point A to point B, the whole thing could be done on bikes. I'm just saying that even in a utopian bike society, which some would argue Copenhagen and Amsterdam are, it's because they can run all their errands on a bike because all their errands are in two square miles because of density and all the other great land use principles that have been applied there. We don't have that luxury in the United States. And... Um, Though we can try things to rectify that, code next, um, it's really difficult. And y'all, we're working in a really, really tough political environment to get good tenants of urban planning delivered to citizens is very, very difficult. And I think that urban planners in general, my, this was my beef at Penn, I don't know this program well enough, but when I was at Penn, I was like, what are we doing? Like, we 
as planners need to be the leaders who are coaching the politicians and the citizens on this rather than being so technical. Because we have done the technical work for the last 50 years and we have not been able to move the needle as much as we want. So I think in order to, as technology is evolving faster than our uh, planning, we can pump out planning graduates, right? We need to start changing the, the conversation. And we, we have to get ahead of it and be the leaders that politicians need to, to educate them. Just a comment or uh, point. Um, back to the uh, slides that you uh, showed comparing Austin uh, with uh, uh, Seattle and another city. I think that it, uh, here in local case, Austin, uh, we, we uh, desperately need quality competitive system and it has been improving one uh, personal experience say some 10 years ago when I first uh, arrived here uh, in Austin I, I drove and uh, walked using the parking and ride system in Lakeline uh, over there and in the morning uh, anytime I drove over there uh, I can find a parking spot and then I ride the uh, bus uh, all over here and in the early morning all I saw was deer <laughs> Nowadays, after uh, 7, 30 or 8 o'clock, there's no way I can find a spot for this spot. And then you look at the ridership, particularly during the uh, rush hours, buses, and then the trains, packed. Meaning that, meaning what? Well, the downtown congestion uh, is getting worse, but it's creating a better environment for providing bus services. Well, when we have quality, better, Transit services, transit sector will, increase, will gain the market share. So then I, I think I'm fully uh, with you in terms of uh, promoting this uh, better service, better technology, uh, whether it's uh, fully automated or semi-automated uh, transit. The point is how we can increase the quality and competitiveness of public transit. We definitely have to make it more inviting. I mean, look, transit needs to lift its game. And, and basically, the way I see it is transit as an industry is grabbing its straws right now um, and has to lift its game to make it more inviting. Um, you know, we're also at a point in time where America more than ever does not want to be around people not like themselves. And so to ask a white-collar person who has never taken transit to get on a bus with a crack addict is really difficult. And I think we need to start having that conversation. People are not comfortable anymore with being as to the extent, now, I don't know how, because they're just looking at their damn phone, so why, who, how are they even noticing who is on the bus? But anyway, the experience of transit has to be better. And in that case, we, I would argue that we always have to have somebody on, on the vehicle to make everyone feel safe. And, you know, if there's a medical emergency, there's a slew of use cases that you could justify why to continue having some presence of security and so forth. Um, yeah, we've got to make it more inviting. And, and there's loads of ways you could do that. You could do it through offboarding, electric, just electrification of the fleet instantaneously makes it a smoother ride. It's a, it's a much better ride. Um, there's a ton of things that we could be doing. Another aspect, I guess, when you look at the transit and particularly rail, uh, a couple of my students did a study uh, about the property values along the, it's a red line, and, and they found uh, property values, and they got increased property values and after sustained operation. I think that's another dimension of the transit. Yeah, and it's, yeah. But when we look at the trend, whether it's rail or bus or others, we should go beyond just trend, it's operation itself, a broader picture. Totally agree, 100%. And P.S., if anybody's ever paid property taxes, uh, my old client used to joke, he worked on the project full time, and he was like, I don't know if I'd vote for it if it was a raise in property taxes. 
Um, we have made so much progress in transit, and I'd like to thank professionals like John Michael and Zach and people working on this stuff full time have been very, very helpful in moving that needle. We have come so far in the last 10 years in Austin, um, and there is evidence to suggest it's working. And if you guys followed CAP Remap, I mean, ridership has gone up as a result of some of the changes from CAP Remap. So we, we got to keep doing what we're doing. Um, the only other thing I want to add to what you're saying is uh, another area that Austin could lift its game is, is tying that public-private development together a little bit more strongly so that TIF districts and so forth are created, which you know all about. Um, and that TOD model could just be more broadly applied. But we're getting there. Yeah. Um, since Randy Clark has been, like, at least for now, pretty exclusively focusing on ART, what do you think that means for, like, as we get further in the Project Connect process, if the technology just isn't there and he's not been selling it so much, like, for trust and like, public perception for capital? Well, he has been caveating a lot of his statements with, we'll have to find out in this next phase of NEPA. So everybody has to do NEPA unless you're Elon Musk, in which case you can just bore a tunnel under people's homes without federal approval. But everybody else has to, um, to go through a very prescribed environmental process. And it, you guys know about NEPA, so I'm not going to go into that. Um, the engineering reports will be the truth teller on that one. Um, I think he's right that ART is coming, so I don't think that will ever end up being a lie. It's just a matter of when. Um, the, those are, again, like those are all just, in my opinion, like non-issues compared to let's have a real conversation with the public about the fact that two blocks from your house, we want to take away a lane. I call it lane gain, which is so cheesy, but from a throughput standpoint, it is like lane gain. Oh, and James, I forgot. James is working on this stuff full time too, you guys. Give it up for James, TTI. <laughs> um, and, and then the other part that we have to have a real heart to heart with the public on is how the hell are we gonna pay for this stuff? Because quite frankly, we don't have a lot of options, guys. All right, our, our sales tax is, you know, 8.25. We cannot raise it. The Texas legislature says we, I mean, the Constitution of Texas says we cannot raise it. Now, our friends in Seattle and L.A. super annoyingly just say, dear legislature, would you let us ask our voters if they will tax themselves? Yes, go right ahead. Voters, would you be willing to tax yourself for a better high-capacity transit network? Sure. Resoundingly, 70-something nauseating percent. I will gladly pay another penny. We don't even have that option, guys. We don't have it. That's how they're all doing it with this penny sales tax. That's like the best, the best way to do it because it's super straightforward. It, anyway, and we don't have that. So what do we have? Well, we have property taxes. Good luck with that. Um, what else do we have? We have P3s. We have the ability to do TIF financing, um, but there's not many folks in town talking about it. Um, and then we have other things like sin tax, right? Gasoline, I mean, uh, cigarette, caffeine, all that stuff. And then we also have parking revenue. And parking revenue is a nice one, only it's also going away. So, uh, I would encourage you, I think we're out of time here too, guys, but I, I really think that um, if we could all focus on those two things, right, public outreach about the lanes and messaging that, and then two, how we're going to pay for the darn thing, I think the rest of the mode stuff is going to sort itself out. There are whole cadres of professionals in town and in D.C. who are working on that full time. Ain't nobody working on how we're going to pay for it. There's like two people I know of in town that are working on that, and they don't have a a report yet. Um, so that is that. And if y'all didn't notice, I'm very candid. I like to tell like it is. You guys have a lot of work to do in your career, so I like to cut to the chase. <laughs> Dr. Oden knows that. 
All right, that's it. Um, that's all I got. It, but let, let me know. I think my... Uh,